Welcome back. I'm Bob Wheeler, Principal Analyst at the Lindley Group, and I'm going to be moderating our next session on uh, the new infrastructure edge. As uh, cloud services rise in popularity, we're seeing service providers pushing compute closer to the edge of the network to, re to reduce response time. Uh, we'll be talking very much about um, this part of the uh, the edge rather than client devices um, like uh, our keynote speaker we're speaking about this morning. Um, we've got some interesting talks today. Uh, we'll have four talks in this session, followed by Q and A and a panel discussion. Um, so if you can hold your questions until the panel, um, we'll try to get to them then. But I think we'll have some interesting discussion with our four different speakers here. Um, so our first speaker in this session is from Centaur Technology. Uh, Mike Thompson is uh, a CPU neural and performance engineer at Centaur. He's been an engineer at Centaur since 2015, involved in both x86 processor and AI accelerator design. He, his, his contributions extend to RTL design uh, device drivers, runtime software, and performance evaluation. Um, and Mike is going to be talking about uh, software optimization on the x86 processor with integrated AI coprocessor. And I see Mike is on. And Mike, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, thank you. Uh, so like you said, my name is uh, Mike Thompson. I'm a senior engineer at Centaur Technology. And today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the software optimizations we've been doing this past year for our high performance x86 SOC that has an integrated AI code processor. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Centaur and our processor platform. So Centaur is a 25 year old startup in Austin, Texas owned by Via Technologies. Uh, we have a small team, about 100 people. Uh, but with those 100 people, we do everything that's needed to design from scratch. Uh, x86 processors. So that includes architecture, logic, design, um, microcode, design verification, and so on. And over the decades, uh, our designs have been shipped by many tier one OEMs. Our processor platform is CHA. Uh, this is a server class 64-bit x86 SOC. It has eight cores, 16 megabytes of L3 cache, four DDR4-3200 memory controllers, 44 lanes of PCI Express, AVX 512, multi-socket support, and it has Haswell level performance. But what makes this unique is that we also have an integrated AI coprocessor. So I'll call that CTAIC or just AIC from here on. Um, but what's very uh, remarkable about this is this is the world's first high performance x86 processor with an integrated AI coprocessor. I won't go into a lot of details about this, but you can refer to our presentation from the Spring Lindley conference or from our ISCA paper for more hardware details. Our accelerator, our AI coprocessor, is a 4096 byte wide SIMD architecture with 20 tera ops per second performance. It has its own 16 megabytes of SRAM with 20 tera terabytes per second of throughput. It has two DMA ports for reading and writing data to system RAM. Uh, it has, supports multiple data types, as you can see, and it runs at two and a half gigahertz with the rest of the chip. And this isn't just something that we're planning, this is something that's real, it's in silicon. And we have submitted uh, MLPerf benchmark suite results both last year and this year. So the x86 and AIC platform is, is pretty important. Uh, it provides performance and flexibility. Uh, since the AIC is integrated with the cores, uh, we can provide very low latency. We have high throughput. It's an integrated solution, so it has a small form factor. Since it's x86, uh, it's a ubiquitous platform. And if the performance we provide just isn't enough for what you need, this is also uh, flexible and expandable to multi-socket, multi-system, or you could uh, put in third-party uh, PCI Express expansion cards. So I mentioned uh, MLPerf. Here's a comparison uh, of our speed up from last year's submission in MLPerf version 0 0.5. That's the table on the left. And our submission this year, version 0 0.7, the table on the right. I won't get into all the details, uh, all the data here, but I will, um, make a few notes of important things. Uh, the first is, if you'll notice SSD MobileNet V1, we already had very good latency last year and we improved that even more. But even more uh, impressive, we uh, increased our throughput by 300%. Uh, 
Another notable thing is with MobileNet v1, last year in versions, MLPerf version 0 0.5, we had the fastest latency out of all submissions. Um, and, and this year in MLPerf version 0 0.7, uh, it doesn't include MobileNet v1 anymore, but we went ahead and ran it anyway, just to show uh, we have remarkable speed up in that as well with nearly 20% improvement in both latency and throughput. So here I'm showing this year's results uh, with Centaur's AIC compared against other vendors. So this data is specifically accelerator vendors who've self-identified their accelerators as targeting edge servers. Um, so here on the left is throughput with a log scale, and here on the right is latency with log scale. Uh, one of the things that you'll note, uh, you might notice right off the bat actually, is that there's very few companies here that actually submitted to, to edge serve as edge servers. There are other uh, reseller vendors, uh, for example, that submitted other, you know, more NVIDIA results. So I'm just including in actual NVIDIA submissions here. Uh, so out of these companies that submitted IVA and MobileInt, their submissions are research submissions implemented on FPGAs and their accelerators are not available yet. So really in this edge server category, there's only Centaur and NVIDIA with submissions. The second thing you might notice is there's, there's sort of these groupings of different levels of performance, both in the throughput and in the latency here. And uh, the reason for that is these very high throughput and low latency uh, submissions are NVIDIA's, you know, their monster accelerators like their, their A100 and their T4. Um, they also uh, have massive area. Um, then this other grouping is SOC oriented uh, edge servers. So like Centaur's SOC and the uh, NVIDIA Xavier SOCs. As you can see, uh, we fall somewhere in between uh, the Xavier NX and the AGX Xavier. We're mostly on par with the, the AGX. So I mentioned that we get this great version 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 speed up. So the reason for that is over this past year, uh, we've done some uh, high level software optimizations. So for example, in the TF Lite interpreter, our delegate interface and our runtime library. So that includes things like uh, adding AVX 512 support in the, for TF Lite operations that otherwise were huge bottlenecks and including in our delegate interface and our runtime library, um, a lot of uh, more x86 parallelism that, than we were doing before. So what about our compiler stack? It's mostly uh, been untouched since last time. And why is that? It's because it was already extremely optimized for the existing workloads that we were running here. It's a monolithic uh, compiler stack. So it crosses a large semantic gap all at once. I'll get into what that means here in a moment. Um, but this has some benefits, but it also has some significant challenges. And Centaur is uh, replacing this uh, compiler stack with a new MLIR based uh, ML compiler stack. So I want to give you a comparison of what a conventional ML compiler stack looks like versus our new ML or uh, MLIR compiler stack. So companies tend to be moving away from these conventional ML compiler stacks for good reason. Uh, th these compiler stacks are often uh, math based on just math libraries and they're monolith monolithic, which means they're going from some uh, high level graph representation down to optimized assembly all at once. And, and, and it's hand tuned, so that's great for, for existing workloads, but it's also a drawback because for new workloads, it involves a lot of effort for that hand tuning. Uh, it also means that when you're doing optimizations, you're often doing it to assembly here. It can be very difficult to analyze that assembly and, and really have that uh, high level view that maybe would make it um, easier uh, to add um, optimizations to. It also means that when you go into change something, you tend to touch a lot of the code and it tends to break everything. Um, but one of the, the most difficult aspects of this is that at this high level, at this graph level, it's uh, framework specific. So it's, it's TensorFlow or PyTorch or TF Lite. Um, and so this, this pass you're doing to take it down to optimized assembly, if you wanna support a new framework, you have to do it all over again. Uh, so it's, there's very low reusability. Uh, in comparison, here's an example of what an MLIR based compiler stack could look like. Uh, MLIR stands for multi-level uh, intermediate representation. Uh, this is an LLVM project. Uh, each one, as you can see, uh, its name describes what it is. So there's these multiple levels in between uh, different levels of abstraction. Each of these levels is called a dialect. Uh, it allows you to 
add functionality or optimizations at whatever abstraction level makes the most sense. This example, I've added uh, four levels, but really uh, you could have as few or as many of these dialects as you want, whatever is most convenient. Um, one of the biggest benefits here though, is that uh, going from this top level, uh, you know, framework specific graph representation, once you translate that into a, a, a graph, a, still a high level, but a graph level dialect, you're no longer um, dependent on that framework. You're framework agnostic, which means that everything below this, this entire stack can be reused for any frameworks you want. Uh, maybe to convince you that MLIR is not a passing fad, um, it's not so that it, there's many common problems across different companies and, and domains that MLIR is already helping to solve. Uh, there's a, a lot of extremely talented, very competent people from these many companies uh, contributing. Uh, it's already helped uh, Centaur solve some of the problems we were facing and Centaur is already in communication with and, and collaborating with uh, some of these MLIR folks. And uh, just to show you some of these heavy hitters, right, some of these big names of people who have partnered and MLIR's partner list is growing. So I want to show you what our specific MLIR compiler stack looks like. So you'll notice here on the left, um, you know, once, once we're translating from this framework specific graph, we, we can have the opportunity to pass any high level intentions uh, that help with optimizations or adding functionality to any level of, of our compiler stack instead of having to try to use uh, analyze assembly. Uh, so in, in doing this, I want to show you what it looks like to do this translation from this high level graph to a target specific graph dialect. So here we have a very simple model in PyTorch. We have quantization, a conv, and another conv, and then a dequantization. Down below here, we, uh, we're using our custom translator tool to, tran to walk through that graph and to translate into our high level MLIR textual representation. So you can see here, um, it's, it's very easy to understand how this maps to this. We here have our uh, quantize, conv, conv, and dequantize. Uh, these are all in our AIC graph dialect. So you look at this and, and it looks like theoretically this should be a very simple translation and it should be. Unfortunately, PyTorch was not uh, designed with this in mind. Uh, so it has actually been very difficult. Uh, we were very lucky. Uh, NVIDIA's open source project TR Torch uh, was a huge help. Uh, we looked, through, we were able to look through its source code and and learn how to better parse and convert. Uh, but this is this front end translation uh, is a common problem that many companies will face. And in fact, LLVM has an incubator project called NP Comp. Uh, it does many other things, but it's slated to eventually include this front end translation. And when they do support this, we'll be able to use that. Anybody will be able to use that. And just to reiterate, once you have that translation done, none of the rest of that MLIR stack uh, is dependent on uh, that framework anymore. So you can use that one stack for uh, any uh, framework. And in fact, uh, TensorFlow and TF Lite are also moving towards a, an MLIR based approach. Um, so this is, this is really a win for everyone. So after we've done this front end translation, we're in our graph, AIC graph dialect. And here we can do whatever makes the most sense to add and to optimize at that high level. So for example, quantization, constant propagation and merging high level ops operations. From there, we lower to our AIC kernels dialect. So this is a loop based dialect. It, uh, it's, typically these kernels will have nested loops or the innermost loop will be uh, hand tuned for best performance. And then outside of that, this dialect in this dialect, we can do interkernel optimizations, loop fusion, and streaming optimizations. From there, we lower to our AIC assembly dialect. Uh, so in here, in this dialect, it makes the most sense to, for figuring out where to schedule DMAs, for example, early, so that the data arrives when we need it, uh, it, to analyze what the program looks like, so we can partition the programs uh, to the appropriate sizes for the accelerator, and we can do things like constant folding, loop invariant code motion, and x86 and AIC uh, scheduling optimizations. From there, we lower sort of to our AIC runtime dialect. Here we do setup and teardown function outlining. We do double buffering of the uh, AIC programs that were partitioned in the previous dialect. We do further x86 and AIC scheduling optimizations. 
Um, so I say we sort of lower to this dialect because every one of these dialects is actually a standalone dialect and they could live side by side in line in the same code. And in fact, that's what we do with our runtime dialect is it has several helper functions that are used throughout all of these other dialects. So after this, as we lower to LLVM IR, this means we now have you know, this vast LLVM and MLIR ecosystem to take advantage of. So we can use standard LLVM and MLIR dialects uh, for further optimizations, basically for free. So while we're still on the slide, I want to just point out a few kind of main takeaways from this high level. Uh, the first is, you know, as opposed to the old approach where we are uh, analyzing the assembly, uh, we, we really want to have this global view where we can uh, analyze, you know, where it makes sense, uh, but also be better able to do things like manage resources, do prefetching, and so on. But not only that, this also gives us a high level view of both the host and the device in line in the same code. Uh, which is new and interesting. This is not something that has been uh, possible before. I want to show you an example of what it takes comparing the old stack to the new stack for adding a, some functionality. Uh, so for, for accelerators like ours that have a stack based internal or sorry, a scratch pad based internal RAM rather than uh, you know something that's cache coherent, it means that any accelerator that has this approach can run out of internal RAM and uh, to to move forward with that, you have to support data streaming. With our old stack, this was very difficult and time consuming uh, because we're adding this logic during assembly generation. Uh, and this was complex, unique logic per kernel. So that means that if, if you have you know, a large model with lots of kernels or lots of operations, you're adding a lot of unique code for each one of those. And it, so it can take weeks to debug and, and very uh, time consuming because it's your debugging assembly. Compare that to our new stack where uh, we already have these different dialects. We can pick where it makes the most sense to add using common reusable MLIR interfaces, add a simple pass. Uh, so we've done this and it only took a couple of days to add this functionality and to debug it. But another benefit is that it's not in assembly yet. So we could actually, after this, this pass that's added, we could still lower it to x86 or to our AIC or theoretically, theoretically to some other um, accelerator if we wanted to. I also want to go in more depth about what it means like having this view of both the host and the device at the same time. Um, so this is something that's especially beneficial for heterogeneous systems for simplifying software development. You can imagine normally you might have some binary you have compiled for your accelerator and then you just have your host in this case x86 um, you know doing the control before it handing off you know saying hey go execute this and then resuming control once it finishes. But here as you can see uh, in our MLIR, we have standard MLIR x86 control loop here. We have our AIC runtime using x86 code to do data movement. So here, writing data to the accelerator. And then here we have the accelerator doing executing some model. And then afterwards we have the runtime again using x86 code to read out the data. And so first of all, you have both host x86 and accelerator AIC code here in line together. Um, so what we can do is we can analyze this, this level of abstraction and say, hey, uh, these writes before and reads after should be DMAs. So we can uh, promote those to, an a to the AIC execution uh, in line, just uh, move those in this, in, this, it, um, in this code. We can also do that with the uh, x86 loop here. We can see that, that that's there, that we can become part of the AIC execution. So really this is, this is remarkable that we can all do all this in line um, or do some combination. Maybe we want some of those to be x86 and some of them to be AIC. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, it, it, this, is, this is new, this is not something that's been possible. Um, it, it's really great. This is the future for heterogeneous uh, compilation, being able to do everything in one place. So in conclusion, uh, Centaur's AIC and x86 SOC is, is high performance. It's a ubiquitous platform. We've shown that over this past year, we can do great, have great speed up uh, in MLperf. Uh, but not only that, by moving to this new MLIR based uh, compiler stack, uh, we've been able to much more rapidly bring up new models, new frameworks, um, reuse code that we're writing, and also reuse code that other companies are contributing. Uh, it's really exciting to have this heterogeneous compilation in one place uh, and we're excited to keep moving forward with it. And uh, thank you.
Great.